So our final session today, please welcome to the stage Jorge Tittinger, co-author of Differences That Make a Difference. George, Jorge is a multi-high-tech 100 awardee and a longtime member of the high-tech family. Most recently, Jorge was president and CEO and board member of Silicon Graphics, one of the leading global companies in high-performance computing. Following the sale of Silicon Graphics, Jorge has served as a strategic advisor and EVP of Enterprise Group at HPE and KLA, KLA 10 Core. He is a strategic advisor to Transparent Business, an e-commerce company in the remote work management and coordination market, an Empresa Editoria, El Comercio in Peru. Mr. Tittinger also serves on several public and private and nonprofit boards. He's a longtime high-tech member, a big supporter of our community. He has been a mentor. He has been a sponsor for various of our people. And I'd like you to welcome Jorge to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. So they told me I need to entertain you until the, the party. But that's like five hours, so it's too long. So I'm going to keep it shorter to just about 30 minutes. And I do want to, before I start, I do want to introduce my co-author for the book, Pedro Espinosa, who's sitting here. And he's going he's gonna to join me for Q&A at the end of my, my talk. Um, so differences that make a difference, what, what's the book about? And really, we aimed. Um, to write a book that was a call to action uh, that showed that, you know, that uh, inclusion and diversity uh, have a positive impact on the bottom line. And I heard uh, the bulk of Miriam's presentation, and you know, it, everything she talked about diversity and inclusion is absolutely true. Um, I, I won't read all of this. I'll leave it there for a, for a second. Uh, Pedro and I are both from Peru. Um, he makes sure that he points out throughout the book how much younger he is than me. <laughs> and you know, I just colored my hair to look older, so, so I would be taken more seriously. But, but uh, the, the truth is, even in the process, uh, we wanted to be diverse. Uh, the, the process, we were actually, many people who are from this area know Ron Gonzalez. He was the ex-mayor of San Jose uh, and the CEO of the Hispanic Foundation of Silicon Valley. Um, and Ron is the guy who introduced Pedro and, and me. Uh, I was the chairman of the Hispanic Foundation of Silicon Valley until last Sunday when I, you know, I termed out. So I had been there 10 years, and that place is doing great work just like, like high tech. And we started, Pedro wanted to interview me for the bo a book he had in mind. And after the interview, we agreed that we, wanted, that we would write the book together. And, we interviewed over 150 people. Um, not, we didn't plan to interview over 150 people. You know, it just so happened, and it was incredibly difficult, as you can imagine, to set up the meetings and and get uh, time on some of these folks' calendars. And and these are top, top, top leaders in tech, in public uh, service, in education. And we also talked to people in different countries. We truly wanted to bring diversity into our book about diversity and inclusion. So what we bring with the book, uh, as, like I said, it's a call to action for decision makers by decision makers. But it's the voices of this huge uh, number of people who are making changes and who are making things happen. That's what you get in the book. Um, these are the names of the chapters. Okay, I'm not going to go over every chapter because we would be here until the dance, and so we're, we're going to cover just a few. Uh, and it's kind of a, you know, a recipe about how to think about inclusion and diversity, what to do about it, and why it matters. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about a few of the chapters, uh, highlight some of the quotes that are in the book. Um, I brought my book. I don't have it with me here, but I think I have put a little post-it on every page. You know, every time I read the book, I find things that I go, oh, this is really interesting, and so I put a little post-it. 
Uh, then the next time I read, I've read the book about six times now. Um, and so now I'm using color codes to see which time I read what. Because, uh, every, you know, like, again, every time you read it, there's something really uh, impactful and meaningful. And I, you know, I, I want to highlight that. So let's start with what you name it matters, how you do it matters more. What do we mean by that? And so this whole conversation is about diversity and inclusion. And in the past, we all focus on diversity, right? The talk, and even uh, in many of the larger corporations, there were chief diversity and inclusion officers. It's now flipped, right? And, and we learned through a lot of the interviews the reason for this, for this change. And actually, we believe it's meaningful, right? So diversity happens. You know, you show up to, to a meeting, you show up to something where there's people from different backgrounds, different genders, different ages, et cetera, et cetera, and you have a diverse group. But unless they're really listened to and invited to the conversation, they're not included. So now, in most corporations, they've actually changed the name to Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officers, where really what matters is that these people are invited to the conversations, they participate, they're fully engaged with their entire selves in the business that they're engaged in. There's a quote in the book. You, I'm, I'm not going to read the ones that I put up, put up here. You can read them. There's a quote in the book that I really like for its simplicity. Diversity is about being invited to the dance. Inclusion is being asked to dance. And we will see how many people are included tonight at the party. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Clues, right? Why, why is it better? Why does it have an impact? You know, so you have better access to talent, better informed and enhanced decision making, more customer insight. You know, the cus uh, one of the areas that we focus on is the whole age diversity, right? Most, com most larger companies uh, are not necessarily employing people that are like their customers. You know, by 2025, 75% of the buyers of everything are going to be millennials. 75%. And most companies have not yet changed the way they market to their clientele. We still do it through newspapers. We do it through emails. We do it through Facebook. You know, I have two daughters that are millennials. I don't think they know what a newspaper is. Um, they never respond to my emails. So they always don't read email. It's only when I text them that they actually have a response. And, but we're not changing that. We're not being inclusive from the perspective of um, you know, incorporating these differences uh, in, in, the, in the people who are buying, in who the customers are. You know, customers are going to be much more prone to buy from people like them. Okay. New hires are much more prone to sign up for a company if there's people like them. Being the only one is very difficult. The only women on a board, the only Latino, Latinx on a particular group, very difficult. So people want to be part, they want to belong, and they want to belong to, to situations that are like them. Um, so here, one of the quotes is, there's, there was a study, a McKinsey study, and there's actually two, 2016 and 2018, that showed that companies that had gender diversity above the average produced 15% better results from the profitability perspective. That was the 2016 study. The 2018 study said that went up to 21%. Okay, But if, if there was ethnic diversity, that number actually doubled. It was 35%. So there's no doubt that because of the reasons that are listed here, diversity drives better innovation, better innovation drives better products, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? However, you know, everybody understands it. You know, we, it was actually fairly easy to get to talk to people about the book and about this topic. The hard part was coordinating schedules, but people were very willing to talk to us about this, because it's a very relevant topic. And you would think that we have advanced a ton. And compared to 10, 15 years ago, we have advanced a ton. But we're still very, very far behind where we ought to be. So interesting fact. There are more corporate CEOs in the US named John or David than women CEOs. 
Just John and David. Forget about the Roberts and the Peters and the Georges and stuff. Just John and David more than women. You know, there are studies that show that when people submit resumes with African-sounding names, African-American-sounding names, versus the exact same resume with, with an Anglo-sounding name, the Anglo-sounding name gets a call back, the other one doesn't. Okay? 30%. Men are 30% more likely to be promoted than women in the same jobs. You know, so, you know, yes, we've made progress, but we're way behind. The platform is burning. Something needs to be done today. We talked about uh, the demographics, age, really, really different ways to engage in their company, different ways to react to leadership, different ways to care about what's important between baby boomers, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z. And if we're not incorporating in our workforce, in our work environment, in our workplace, a means to actually uh, let them thrive, uh, they're not going to join us. Okay? And we're going to miss something really significant. Um, 216, this is a great number, I think. You know, 216 of the Fortune 500 companies today were founded by an immigrant or a child of an immigrant. Almost half, right? And if you look at the patents that are uh, filed in the US, immigrants are filing two, twice as many patents as non-immigrants on a per capita basis, 2x. So really significant number. I mean, these are not numbers to ignore. These are serious, uh, you know, action driving numbers. Um, and then there's a quote that I like because it's, it's, you know, a kind of very aligned with what Miriam was saying. You know, if leaders don't make it absolutely clear that inclusion is a core value, it won't happen. I didn't know I was a magician. Also, I can make things disappear <laughs> and reappear. Anyway. Inclusion, I, I like this one. Let's, let's talk about this one. Do you recognize these names? Let's go to the bottom. Alexander Graham Bell. What did he invent? Yeah, I said we have a great audience here. Yeah, Scottish. Who buys at Nordstrom's? A few people buy Nordstrom's. It's too expensive, I get it. But he's Swedish, I think. Or I'm, I'm losing my, uh, my slides. Uh, Magic again. It only works sometimes. Um, well, I'll have to wing it. Um, so let's see if this comes. There you go. OK. Jerry Wang. What company? Yahoo. They're very good. Taiwanese. So you see, and then. There's all these American sounding companies that are actually started by immigrants. Many, many companies that you think are, oh, yeah, this for sure is an American company. Well, it is American because we were here, but they were started by immigrants. So inclusion drives innovation, right? If you think about innovation as a funnel, the more diversity you put at the very top of the funnel, the bigger chances are that at the bottom of the funnel, when things come out to either be a product or a service offering, they would be better than if it's everybody is homogeneous. Right? There's a great quote in the book from the CHRO of Intel that says, when I am asked to, to get, make the case for diversity, my response is, you make the case for homogeneity. There's no case, right? We all live it. The only reason, we're in Silicon Valley, the only reason, not the only reason, one of the only reasons of why this valley is by far the most innovative place in the world is because there's people from 130 countries participating in the innovation economy of Silicon Valley. Think about that, 130 countries. I thought there were only 118 countries in the world, but I was wrong. There's a lot more, and they're all here in the valley. 
you know, so th this slide talks about how can we make the pipelines better, because there's a complaint always, I hear it all the time, when I were recruiting for boards, when we're recruiting for executives, that there's not enough candidates. They don't meet the criteria. That it's a supply problem. And my point is, that's BS. For those who know, don't know what BS means, ask somebody uh, next to you, I, I'm not gonna explain. <laughs> because if your criteria is, it needs to be a CEO or a CFO or a recent CEO or CFO, they need to be around 50 and white, and they need to play golf and belong to my country club, yeah, maybe there's not enough people like that. But if you broaden, your criteria to people who can really contribute, who have the experience that you need in your company, whether as an executive or as a board member, the, the pipeline is huge, right? So there's practices in companies, you know, blinding is something that's now happening more and more and more where people are removing things like the name, they're removing phrases that may sound particularly ethnic so that the reviewers of the resumes don't have an unconscious bias to either positive or negative against those resumes, right? And you can read more about that. Uh, training the trainers, you know, obviously, the more that we can equip more and more and more people to think and act with inclusion and diversity in their minds, the better it's going to be for the future. Um, not going to get into the politics. <laughs> But we're all in really weird times, uh, this in, especially in this country, especially if you're Latino, uh, hopefully that gets uh, resolved. Uh, but we need to account for this, right? We need to account for this. And it doesn't need to be just politics at the country level. It's also very important to have policies at the corporate level that are really important, that actually drive this um, as part of the company, as something that is equally important as revenue, maybe. Okay? Um, we're going to skip that. You know, th this is really interesting, this chapter. You know, the UK Garden newspaper asked these three people to think about and describe in their own view what the world would be like in 2050. So that's a question that I want to ask all of you to do. What will it be like, and how will it show up, especially from the perspective of inclusion and diversity? And I'm going to talk a little bit about something that is kind of scary, actually. And we, at the same time, we need to embrace. Right? The, there's a perfect storm brewing between advances in technology, mainly driven by artificial intelligence, robotics, drones, Etc., that will be tremendously disruptive to administrative and manufacturing jobs. Okay, number one. The second one is the ever escalating cost of advanced education is getting more and more and more expensive to get an advanced degree. And unfortunately, the jobs that are going to exist in the future will require more advanced degrees. And so you either are rich or a great athlete or musician or something, you get a scholarship, or you're going to be indebted forever once you graduate. And even though you went to a great school, won't be able to participate in the consumer economy that's being built. And the third element is the growing income inequality, especially in the US and China. And so these three things together are causing what I call this perfect storm. And by 2030, Again, in, the, in another McKinsey. Anybody here from McKinsey? Nobody. They do some great studies <laughs> on this topic, right? And so they, in their study, by 2030, they predict that between 75 million and 300 million jobs will be displaced. Think about that. 75 million to 300 million. Unfortunately, these jobs are administrative, manufacturing, et cetera. And unfortunately for our community, they're jobs that are mostly held by women and people of color, these minorities. Uh, minorities are this amorphous group that people call minorities when we're actually more 
than the majority and growing faster. But the reality is we now need to start training people, reskilling them for the jobs of the future. Technology will produce more job opportunities than it will destroy. But the jobs will be very different. And unless we take action today to do something drastic with our education, with our corporate policies, with how we mentor people, with how we deal, somebody asked about uh, your children, with how do you actually you know, encourage and, and provide opportunities for your children to actually get educated for the jobs of the future, not the ones of the past, we, the Latinx community, will have a big problem. And the time to act is now. Uh, this is exactly what I just talked about. And, and you know, one of the things I said was this, this whole thing about higher education, right? So there's a study that says that 53% of the jobs in the US are going to need more than high school level. And only like, low 40% of the people are actually trained beyond that. So that's a gap. And if you don't, if you don't finish high school, 55% uh, of the people who, don't, who only have high school will be displaced. But if you have a bachelor's degree, it's better, but it's not great. 24% will be displaced. So there's a need for this advanced education. And that's a need to necessarily come from a university or college. But even if you're taking technical roles, you need to actually be quite advanced to actually hold the jobs of the future. And companies really need to either stay on top of innovation and learn how to actually take advantage of it instead of react to innovation changes that will drive uh, those changes in the future. So the book, like I said, is a call to action. And my question, our question to all of you is, what can you do now, you, your company, your city, et cetera? And I'll stop there, and I'm going to invite Pedro to join me. And we'll take questions from the audience. So thank you very much, by the way, for listening. <laughs> Pedro, Pedro. So don't we look the same age? He went to I look younger. <laughs> I went to Berkeley, and he went to the lesser school, Stanford, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, we've been, we've been very diverse in the way we actually went about writing this book. So open to you guys. Uh, we have about nine minutes uh, of Q&A. Jorge, Pedro, this was incredible. So I work as an inclusion and diversity practitioner, and my company, Tech Systems, has also led with leading with inclusion first. To your point in the book, diversity is a fact, and inclusion is um, an option. It's a choice. So I guess related to your interviewing, what all did you gather to talk about and maybe share some thoughts on what I believe to be really the nucleus of what it is when we're talking about inclusion and diversity, and that's equity. To your comment earlier, Jorge, diversity, it, it's difficult when you're the only one in the room, but it's much easier to be in the room when you're on an even playing field. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, great question. So you're talking about equity. So when we talk about diversity with Jorge, we really wanted to focus beyond the obvious of diversity of gender and ethnicity and nationality but it's really the diversity of background and experiences and skills. And this reminds me of the interview that I had with Eric Schmidt, who used to be the CEO of Google, was that he mentioned how like, the founding team of Google and of very other successful tech companies, the team members really complemented each other. And as a matter of fact, last week I was having breakfast with Dan Wolverhoeman, who was the CEO of NetApp, and he shared how his chief his COO and his right hand was like a sales guy and he's an engineer. And we're talking about beyond just the obvious of your nationality or your ethnic or your race, but it's going beyond that. Great. And I think, I think the, you know, and the, the focus on women has been around for longer than some of the other uh, minorities, quote unquote. Um, and it isn't about women want to be the same, right? So when you talk about equity is, equity of opportunity, right? And, and I think that is absolutely crucial. So, you know, and it's, again, the flexibility of adjusting an environment. Pedro and I had a, 
presentation about the book yesterday, one of the things that he talked about was this founder of a company who, young entrepreneur who is now a mother. And the setup in her own company wasn't such that she could take time off to see her kid, for example. What, what, what's that, right? We all should be able to do that and at the same time contribute. And it, you know, women and men are different. So how do we actually ensure that the environments allow for both to be fully in and fully contributing? That's important. Other questions? Thank you for the question. That was a really good question. Thank you so much. Uh, I am Ivan Estrada from Morgan Stanley. Uh, this call to action definitely is something that you know, we need to be thinking about from a corporate perspective, but also as individuals. Mm -hmm. As we are call calling people to start thinking about how do we reskill people uh, for these jobs of the future, what is that call to action? We, we don't want everybody to be just be a data um, scientists, right? We can. We need a combination of all these different things. So, what is? What are those next steps? Because it's going to take time to put that program in place. Yeah, definitely. Well, the call to action, especially for us who are decision makers and executives, is to be intentional about fostering this culture of belonging. And we can give you tangible examples. When we were interviewing these different executives and leaders from Fortune 500 companies. I encountered this company that for the Hispanic Heritage Month, El Mes Pasado, they were doing una fiesta de salsa con música y chicha morada. And that is great, right? But then we contrasted that with this other Fortune 500 company who in addition to doing the salsa party, they were hiring thought leaders and consultants for doing mentoring and coaching and helping them with their emotional intelligence and helping them with unconscious bias. So guess which company, which ERG is gonna get a better budget from the CEO next year, right? Absolutely the one that's more intentional on coaching, on mentoring, on training and unconscious bias versus the one doing la salsa party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, yeah, if I, were, if I were the CEO making a decision, I'd probably subtract whatever they spent for that salsa party from their budget next year. But, but the other thing is, uh, to your question, yes, it isn't only about we don't want everybody to be a technologist, right? Because then the reality is that's one uh, thing we need. Uh, and there's all these other things, right? And one of the areas that we, we talked about innovation and these changes in innovation are driving needs to change everything, you know, the environment. Uh, the, we, we used an example yesterday, you know, uh, how many people believe that sometime in the next 10 years we will have autonomous cars really driving around, right? 10 years, maybe 15 years in my opinion. But the loss, you know, what happens when an autonomous car gets in an accident? Who gets the ticket? That needs to change. We need lawyers that are going to think about technology in a very different way, right? We need civil engineers. We need people designing the streets so that these cars can actually really drive around without causing problems or reacting to problems from crazy drivers uh, when they're both sharing the roads. So there's a need for all of this. And of course, there's vocational orientations. Uh, and some people are not going to want to be technical but they need to be mindful of what the future is going to look like. So when we talk about reskilling, it's with that in mind. Don't, don't train to be a bank clerk. ATMs already replaced you, right? et cetera. So I don't know what the changes are going to be. I just Now, STEM is a really sure bet, by the way. So if you have a choice, go STEM. If, but if you don't, I mean, there's many, many other things that are absolutely going to be necessary that are very important. Sergio, no, no tough questions from Jorge. Sergio. Uh, Jorge, <laughs> I, I've been enjoying reading I'll the be book. Quick. No. I mean, Sorry, there's Pepe. Oh, I'm sorry. I have been enjoying reading the book, and uh, thank you for bringing all this here to us, and, and this nice summary, in my view. It's very interesting to me that you're presenting this book here where everybody believes and knows about the diversity and inclusion, right? Mm -hmm. And my real, real question to you guys is, what are you doing to bring this book to the middle management of the companies? 
The executives, they get it. We get it. Middle management usually doesn't get it. What can we do to actually get it to that group of people mm -hmm. to make a real, real change? Okay. So I'm going to challenge your, your uh, assertion, Pepe. How many people in this room, people who get it, have actually done something about improving okay, 20 30%? So I think the message is really important. Because we get it intellectually, this is the principled kind of group that needs to actually put it into action. And then it's going to be way easier to talk about to middle management or to companies that are all middle-aged white men or to, you know, I'm on, on five different boards. You have no idea how difficult it is to break away from the country club mentality. Right? Because everybody has that concept of, you know, what's the criteria to be on a board? Oh, they need to look like me. Okay? Most boards still, you know, mid-50s, white men. Uh, actually, there's great progress in the last 10 years. You know, I think right now, actually, and there's more progress in the Fortune 500 companies than in other companies. I think there's about 28% of the Fortune 500 company directors are women now. Significant improvement. And, but it's not 48, it's not 50, it's not 51. Why not, right? But I think, I think it's a great question because we were asked something similar yesterday and the reality is there are going to be groups that can take action today and we would love to see that. And there's going to be groups, when you say diversity, they don't even know how to spell it, right? And so for some, the time might not be right today. But, uh, but you're absolutely right. There's, this needs to become core for all companies. Because if we're not purposely being inclusive, we are unconsciously being exclusive. And that's a problem. Yeah. Then, Pedro. Oh, I was going to ask a simple question. Who here was the first in their families to be a tech executive? That's what I thought, the vast majority of us. So, this reminds me of the interview that we had with Michelle Lee, who was the Under Secretary of Commerce under President Obama. And she was the first female to be the leader of the US Patent and Trademark Office. And she was telling me that if she waited to have like a role model that looked like her, that had the same gender as her, the same background as her, she was never going to attain those goals, right? So going back to your question, Pepe, on corporate boards, and the example that Jorge gave, um, the person who wrote the introduction is Anita Sanz. And she's a board member at Symantec and Pure Storage and other big companies. She said, a lot of these boards, they require the future board members to, be, see, to have experience of CEO of a public company. And she said, well, unfortunately, many women don't have that, right? Many Latinos or immigrants don't have that. But if they're more flexible, and we look at tangible examples from AT&T, from PG&E, these are big companies that have business units, like AT&T Business, that have a Latino, have a woman leader, that's revenue and that P&L is pretty much the same equivalent to a Fortune 500 revenue. So if we change that mentality in corporate boards, we can really make a difference in making a more inclusive corporate America. I think we have time for one more question. Maybe, maybe two more. I see Sergio and anybody else. OK, Sergio. Okay. So on one hand, we have the perfect storm, 70 million to 300 million that they're going to go away. And then we have the emphasis on STEM, which means in the next 10 to 15 years, they're going to be middle management at best. I don't hear a lot about creating our own companies. Mm. So are we doing enough there? Because there's no more diverse company than the company that's funded by a female or mm -hmm. a Latino or Latinx. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, What's missing there? Okay. I think all of us here are decision makers, leaders, and we have the power of not only mentoring people, but also investing in the next, in the next future of Latino entrepreneurs. After I finished doing my first company, Smiley Go, and Ron Gonzalez was on my board, that's mm -hmm. how we met with Jorge, I started not only giving back to my fellow Latino founders at Berkeley, at Stanford, at Berkeley, Skydeck, and Stardex, 
but I also saw that many of these Latino entrepreneurs didn't only need advice, but they needed financial capital. So then I started investing in these startups. And one example is Kiwi. Kiwi Campus started por los colombianos. Do we have any colombianos acá? There we go. So yeah, things like that. I started giving back and investing in these startups started by Latin American immigrants. So I think that's one tangible way that we can do today, investing in early stage technology ventures founded by Latino yeah. entrepreneurs. And I think, you know, this is actually it's a great question, Sergio. One, so we, in other sessions, have talked about, you know, what about us Latin, Latinos is different, maybe in our character, in our idiosyncrasies, et cetera, et cetera. And I just got back from Peru, where I attended the Peruvian Venture Capital Conference. And it was unbelievable. Uh, there were over 1,100 startups, some really good, some not so good. But you know, still, 1,100 startups. Uh, and Peru is not the leader, by any means, in, in startups in Latin America. Uh, you know, Brazil is probably leading. Again, you know, Brazil has 220 million people, but there's a significant movement uh, for for startups. And most Latino countries, uh, their economies are based on on small and medium-sized businesses, right? And so we already have this mentality to start our own thing and do our own things. My distinction between a startup and a small business is the startup has an exit in mind from the very beginning, the small business could be uh, you know, a, a lifestyle type of business uh, forever and ever and ever, right? But there's a huge emphasis on this, and you're right, and I think some of the examples on, in the book are, are you know, uh, age-driven startups where they're, they're only hiring millennials, and they're diverse from the get-go. They don't see the distinctions that we see. So yeah, that's a great way to actually start diverse from the get-go, start inclusive from the get-go. Um, I think we're being kicked out of the stage, are we? Yeah, I'm, 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 I don't know what that means, right? I'm afraid. Um, anyway, so thanks for listening. I know several of you have purchased the book. We have them outside, there's a table, so if you bought the book, come by, we'll give it to you, and we have extra, so if anybody didn't buy it and are, is interested, uh, we, we, can, we can give you a book now. Thank you very much. Thank you.